Yeah, I'm talking about how basically the people that didn't like the formalists or the color field people, who were many, um, associated <clears throat> what I did <clears throat> with those kinds of art, you know, color field type art. I made these stained paintings with bands on the bottom and abstract kind of paintings, poor paintings and wine paintings, and my paintings were in the idiom of um, the formalists. And so there were a lot of like the minimalists and the anti-formalists that associated me with the formalists and they weren't really crazy about me. The problem was the formalists had been poisoned by my so-called friends. So I wasn't really sure what kind of ground I stood on in the formalist universe. I didn't know. I really didn't know. Although Larry Poons was a friend of mine, but I didn't know where he stood either. And in those days, things were in the balance, hanging in the balance. Now, I don't know how it happened, but I told you my mother was in the hospital, so that was my main shot focus. Peter Young was in New York staying with me here in this loft. Um, I, my friend JB was around a lot. Jenny and I were going to the hospital. My brother was in town with his wife. That was my main shot focus. When I would go to see Leo, because I knew Leo Costello, after I was finished seeing Leo, I drifted upstairs at 420 West Broadway. And I would talk to a friend of mine who worked for the Andre Emery Cowell. Ironically enough, I was in school in the Kansas City Art Institute from August 1963 until early November 1963. And I had a roommate for whatever, a month, two months, September, October, and maybe a couple of days on each end. I had a roommate, a guy named Gary Smith. Gary was the guy at that time working at Emmerich. So what I used to do is I'd meet Theo, have a meeting with Castelli, and I'd wander upstairs to say hello to Gary, who was my, my college roommate. And I told Gary what was happening with me was that my mother was very ill. Um, my mother died April 1st, 72. On or around April 7th or 8th or 9th, I don't remember when. Phone rings, I'm upstairs, it's Emmerich on the phone, inviting me to join the gallery. I mean, I had never talked to him before. To this day, I don't know how that happened. I never asked Andre. Could have, but I didn't ask him. I have come to the conclusion that it was a combination of two people. <clears throat> it was Leo. I think Leo called Andre up and said, uh, I'm looking at Ronnie Landfield. I think that you should show his work. Um, and I think it was Gary Smith who, who said to Leo, my friend Ronnie Landfield, his gallery's closing, I think his show's one. So I think the combination of Castelli helping me and Gary wanting to help me. Uh, now, can you can imagine how I felt. My mother had just died. I just lost my gallery. I was 25 years old. I didn't know what was to come. And here's the best gallery in New York calls me up and invites me to join. 
out of the blue. I had never, I didn't approach them. And so Andre offered me a show that February. It was April and it gave me a lot of time. And uh, I said, sure. And so I was showing with the Emory Cowrie when in 1975, the two Davids called me up, David Whitney and David White. And they asked me if I'd be at all interested in lending them three or four paintings <laughs> to put in the entranceway of the Four Seasons restaurant. And I said, sure. And in those days, I was doing these line paintings, kind of like, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen any of those line paintings. I mean, uh, yeah, that, that's an earlier one. That's from 68. But in the early 70s, I was doing freer line paintings squeezed right out of a tube. I was going to Pearl Paint, and I was buying empty paint tubes. And I was mixing colors and making paint tubes in my own colors. And I was doing these paintings on solid grounds with kind of drawing. I mean, I guess I could liken it to uh, Cy Twombly. Uh, I wasn't thinking about Twombly at all. And uh, I was doing like a red ground or an orange ground or a yellow ground or a tan ground or any, and they weren't gray and they weren't scratched. Uh, and I'd pull one out if I had one available, but I, I don't, I have a few of them, I think, up on that platform, but there are some on my website. So on, why, there were the, the ones I gave David, the two Davids, for the entrance of the Four Seasons were these white field paintings with these lines on them. I, I, I put one of them on Facebook, I think. And, uh, that was cool. I mean, uh, why not? And I thought to myself, hey man, wow. I used to sneak into this place in 62, and here it is about a dozen years later, and I got my paintings hanging in this place. A couple of months went by, and now it was 1975, and Philip and David hung in the main room, the Rothko Wall. A painting of mine called Spirit in the Sky, Eight Foot Square. A painting of mine called uh, Garden of Delight. And another painting called uh, Atlantic Sea. Three major works of mine. Stained paintings, Eight Foot Square. Another one was about, <coughs> excuse me, 90 by 93. Another painting was 87 by 72. And they called me up. They returned the line paintings. And they told me they were hanging these paintings that I had no control over. They belonged to Philip Johnson. And would I lend them another one? Small painting. And I said, sure. I lent them one of my paintings, current, 1975, blind painting. And so for the next 10 years, my four paintings were in this main dining room, up these stairs, in the four seasons. And they had, they were the first paintings to hang in that place. Uh, initially, they had commissioned Mark Rothko, and I, I'm assuming Rothko returned their money, and Rothko refused to do it. From me, um, they never offered me any money. They weren't really asking my permission either, because the paintings belonged to Philip Johnson. And uh, I understood that they were going to go up I guess if I strongly and strenuously objected, they would have taken them down. 
but since as a kid I used to go in that place, I I really didn't object. I I wasn't even aware of the Rothko story at that point. So I had these paintings in this very prominent place in the Four Seasons. And uh, I was showing it to Andre at the gallery. <clears throat> It was all downhill after that. Uh, I, I had lunch there with Jenny to uh, see the work when they got home. And uh, this is a true story. Waiter comes over to the table with a telephone saying, Mr. Lamfield, you have a telephone call. And it was Phyllis Tuckman, the art critic, calling me up, congratulating me, asking me, well, how does it feel, Ronnie, to see your paintings? And I was very flattered. And I thanked Phyllis. It was very nice. And I, I mean, I don't know why I was so flattered, actually, at the end of the day. And Jenny had asked me if it was, and my name was on the wall, it wasn't. There were no plaques, they were just the paintings. In those days, we were all so arrogant. We figured everybody knew whose paintings they were. But really, nobody knew whose paintings they were. And that backfired on me. I, I, I don't think I learned the lesson, but the lesson that should have been learned was that day when I had lunch, when Phyllis Tuckman called me up, what I should have done was complain. My name was not on the wall. Because that bit me on the ass five years later. Just like I, I've told you stories earlier about, not today, but how um, Dick Bellamy's not picking me up. Or uh, Dick, maybe not. We were friends. But uh, James Michener not buying a painting from me when he visited my studio in 1967 bit me on the ass about six years ago seven years ago she liked that happen who knew but the reason I'm saying that is in 1979 after my paintings had been up <clears throat> at the four seasons 75, 76, 77, 78 five years in January of 79, I was showing briefly with the Sarah Rentschler Gallery in New York. And Sarah's boyfriend at the time, a guy named Bruce, Bruce's birthday was January 9th. My birthday is January 9th. My brother's birthday is January 9th. My brother was in town. So we invited my father, my wife, my brother, his wife, my then dealer, Sarah Rentschler, her boyfriend, Bruce, whose birthday it was, to have a celebration of our birthdays at the Four Seasons in front of my paintings. And we also, I invited Phyllis Tuckman to join us because her birthday is January 6th. We all had dinner. We all had fun. It was enjoyable. I don't remember who I paid for. I know I paid for it. Phyllis and Jenny and me, maybe my father. Um, I don't think I paid for everybody. But it was very enjoyable, pleasurable, I remember. Yeah, we all had a good time. Sarah said, your name should be on the wall. And I think she began to engineer plaques on the wall, which is what I should have done five years earlier. And I think ultimately she did put, they did put the names up, I don't remember. But the damage was already done. A week or so after that m m meal, or maybe a day or two later, 
ironically enough, coincidentally. Paul Goldberger in the New York Times wrote an article saying there's no heart at the Four Seasons. For a grand place like this, <clears throat> designed by a wonderful architect like Philip Johnson, how come there's no art at the Four Seasons? There's that Richard Lippold sculpture over the bar. How come it's nothing else? That was the gist. I mean, I'm not paraphrasing the damned article, but that was the gist of the article. He might have mentioned, I think he mentioned could be wrong, I think he mentioned that they owned the Frank Stella that was in the back. But he might not have. That might have been in a different article. <clears throat> I was 32 years old. Um, Sarah was a kind of unknown quantity in the art world. She wasn't exactly Andre Emery. I had left the Emmerich Gallery in 77, um, and he, uh, primarily because he wasn't behind me anyway. I mean, it was a kind of awkward mix. I felt very isolated. I didn't know what to do. I really didn't know what to do. And the only thing I could think of to do was to call up Phyllis Tuckman, who is an art critic and a writer and ask her to defend me to please write a letter or a note to Paul Goldberger suggesting he missed seeing the four Ronnie Lanfield paintings that were prominently hanging up in the fucking restaurant She basically told me to go fuck myself. This is the same woman that called me, the same woman I had just taken a dinner there. She didn't say it in so many words. She just said, I was an egomaniac who wanted to see my name in print. Yeah, I was a realist. I had my goddamn work in this prominent spot, in this prominent art architecture critic is acting like I don't exist. Yeah. <clears throat> so I let it go. I let it go. <clears throat> I left Sarah's gallery and not because of that. I was, I was leaving anyway. But I realized there's no point for me to show at that gallery. God bless Sarah, she was a sweetheart. I left her gallery and I didn't have a dealer. And in December of 1979, um, Charlie Coles came back to New York from Seattle where he was working at the Seattle Art Museum. He came here, he offered me a stipend, and invited me to join his count. I, ex I accepted his offer, and uh, once again I was represented by a gallery in New York City. And although, uh, I mean, there are more complications, but one day, I mean, I had four shows of calls. Showing 80, 81, 82, 83, 80, 82, 83, and 84. It's just some group show in 84, 81. Um, in 1984, Goldberger wrote a second article in the New York Times. I had gotten a letter from the owners of the Four Seasons restaurant saying that 
hundreds of thousands of their guests in the last 10 years have enjoyed my paintings. Thank you very much. And they were returning my painting. But they had one that belonged to me. I called David Whitney and asked him what was going on. And David told me that they decided to make a change. <clears throat> and I had commissioned Jim Rosenquist. And my paintings were going to come down. So I took my kids. At that point, I had two kids. I took my kids to lunch at the Four Seasons so they could see the paintings. And to my chagrin, on Atlantic Sea, I saw a cut. Somebody had slashed it. And the other paintings looked like they had really been worn out. And I was uh, quite upset. And uh, my <coughs> painting that belonged to me also had a cut. I called call David and I said, those paintings have to come here. They have to be cleaned. They have to be reframed. And they have to be fixed. I called Charlie Coles. Charlie knew that they were coming down because he and David were going to sell Atlantic Sea <clears throat> to a client in California. And I said to Charlie, you can't sell that painting, it's got a hole in it. The paintings were sent here, uh, except for one, in, uh, Spirit in the Sky. They, David refused to tell me what happened to it. And my understanding is <clears throat> ultimately it was given to a hospital. <clears throat> I've never seen it again. <clears throat> um, the other ones were severely damaged. I hired Rustin Levinson, a very good conservator, and she fixed two of the three. And uh, Atlantic Sea and the one that belonged to me. And the, and the third painting was not, we just cleaned it up, reframed it. And uh, in the middle of that, Goldberger published another article in the Times in which he said, the Four Seasons has finally decided to get some art. They have commissioned Jim Rosenquist, hallelujah. After all these years. Oh, and they have a Frank Stella in the back. I think that's when the Stella was mentioned. No mention. <clears throat> <clears throat> At all about my work. Um, so this time, <clears throat> I wrote a scathing letter to Paul Goldberger and to his editor at the Times demanding to know why I was being discriminated against. Demanding to know what it was that Paul Goldberger had against me. I mean, after all, I had the work up for 10 years and I've had shows in at that point, 1984, I don't know how many one-man shows I'd had, two dozen. Um, and I had work in museums all across the country and in Italy and at the Met. And I wrote a letter to them and I, Goldberger was forced by his editor to apologize to me. And he wrote me an apology and an explanation, which basically said nothing, which I have in my files. So all in all, <clears throat> Rothko had the right idea. And now there's a new ownership, 
the owners are long gone uh, from that place, and uh, whoever owns it now has hired somebody to consistently put new art there. And this guy who changes the art used to be, uh, my understanding is he used to be a chef at the Four Seasons, and currently he owns a gallery in East Village. And he has the franchise whereby some of his artists periodically get to show their work at the Four Seasons. As far as I'm concerned, God bless him, they can do whatever they want. Um, that was an episode that uh, pissed me off, to say the least. <laughs>